Welcome, everybody. Welcome, welcome. I'm Alberto Rios, director of the Virginia G. Piper Center for Creative Writing. In the summer of 2020, the Piper Center was awarded a National Endowment for the Arts Big Read grant. The Big Read aims to broaden an understanding of our world, our communities, and ourselves through the joy of sharing a good book. Arizona has the third largest population of Native Americans in the US and is home to 22 federally recognized tribal nations and other thriving indigenous communities. Arizona's intrinsic link to Native culture and literature made choosing The Roundhouse by Louise Erdrich an obvious choice. Our month long program will celebrate the richness and diversity of indigenous literary arts and culture across the state. With over 25 talks, workshops, book clubs, art shows and events, and over 40 community partnerships, The Big Read is one of the largest programs the Piper Center has ever taken on. We want to give special thanks to our partners, American Indian Policy Institute, ASU Library, Labriola National American Indian Data Center, Dean Jeffrey Cohen at the, Liberal, at the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, Phoenix Public Library, Arizona Humanities, and the countless others who made this project possible. We're excited and we hope you'll join us. Thank you. Hello, hello. Oh, it's so nice to see that you guys are all commenting where you're from. But hello, my name is Surya Taylor, Dagota, she, Surya Taylor Jose, she, Tudatla, and Shli, Lokwa, Bachchen, Shata, Klai, Shmat, Lao, Klai, Yenis, Taylor, Sans, Jose, Shawasin, Shawasan, Rita, Klai, Danny, Taylor, Senior, Jose. Hi, my name is Surya Taylor. I am 19 years old. I am White Man Apache in Navajo, and I served as the inaugural Youth Poet Laureate for Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, my pronouns are they, then, she, her, and yeah, I'm so excited to be here with you all today and to do the land acknowledgement. Um, it is really important that I know we all are from like all over right now. Like I just noticed someone said they're from Flagstaff and um, it's really important that we acknowledge that, you know, we are in this virtual space and we are, you know, sharing this weird kind of awkward space with one another. But it's also kind of beautiful because we get to do cool things like this and we don't have to travel and go so far. But it is important to know that the Piper Writers House and Arizona State University's four campuses are all located on the unseceded ancestral lands of the Akimel, Akam, Pima, Pitash, Maricopa, and many other indigenous peoples' lands. We recognize the original stewards of this land and honor those living here today, including the Gila River Indian community, the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community, the Pasquayaki tribe, and the Fort McDowell Yavapai Nation. Indigenous lives, knowledge, and stories have been rooted here for a long, long time before the university came to be. They remain central to the past, present, and the future of this land. We invite you to join us in acknowledging the land and the history and understand that acknowledgement is simply not enough. Wherever you're joining us from, I hope you'll take the time to learn about the indigenous people that come from that area or whose land you're on. There are many websites where you can actually look it up, which is pretty cool. Um, but yeah, it's really important that you know this so you can support indigenous peoples and help those communities around you in whatever they're doing and all of their own issues. But thank you all for joining us today. Um, stay safe, be well, continue to wear a mask. And yeah, let's get the event started. Shunk, thank you. Welcome. Yate, Shae, Matthew Jake Skeeton and Shea, Sinajin Nishle, Tkobahan Bushes Chin. Hello, everybody. My name is Jake, and it's an honor to join you all this evening. I'm here to provide a little welcome address for tonight's events. And I'm so, so grateful for you all attending here. I'm not sure if that's the right word to use because we're in a virtual space. Normally, when you say, uh, you're sort of speaking to everyone in the room inside you, but it's uh, it could definitely be. I'm hoping it can be applied here as well. Um, uh, yate is such a layered word in, in Navajo. It could be defined in many different ways, but the way I like, I learned from 
Chanel and Lucy Tapahanso. Um, it's about acknowledging everyone around you. And because we're all here connected through fiber wire and uh, these te technological feats, I'm pretty sure um, it still has its uh, transmission of blessings and prayers to you all. Akihat, thank you so much for joining us. Um, language is why we're gathering tonight. Language, storytelling, stories, words, all of that. Language is a tool for beauty and storytelling is the practice of language. Indigenous people have thrived for decades because of storytelling. So we are gathering this evening tonight to talk about the importance of to talk about the importance and potential of storytelling. But before I introduce our wonderful guests this evening, I want to provide a framework, a way, a kind of setting up the table, if you will, really focusing on a Diné thought cycle, a Diné thought model, and how specifically a Diné universe functions within a space like this. And this framework will hopefully um, be able to show you how this conversation um, is going to uh, you know, go through the process. Um, so thank you. Uh, let me just go ahead and quickly provide that framework here. Um, so within the Diné universe, there is a philosophy known as or SNBH for short. And this again is a very layered philosophy it can be defined in many different ways. Um, but I always like to pull and borrow from the net poet Bojan Lewis is is a definition he defines SNBH as the embodiment of living through all things and understanding that all things exist within a system. Um, and so when we follow SNBH as a model, it always begins in the East with insahakes or thinking. I like to borrow Diné scholars, Dr. Vincent Ruerdo's definition of insahakes. Uh, Dr. Ruerdo defines it as conceptualization and Dr. Rowero ties it to identity, identifying yourself as a human person here, um, as an earth, earth surface spiritual being, as a five fingered being here on planet earth. And so that's where we begin. And then we continue on to the South and the South represents Nahat'a or actualization. I see this step as the process of turning the body into a bridge to allow for the imagination and blessings to cross over into the physical world. And then we move on to the third value or stage, the West. And in the West is ina or life or action. So how do we ensure we are living in balance and in beauty in this physical world when so many of our communities have, chased, have faced tremendous suffering and trauma so much so it travels in our blood through our genetics. To answer this question, we also should cover the fourth value of SNBH, which is Sihasin. And Sihasin is in the north, and it means reflection, inflection, assurance, and bravery. For me, this is where storytelling is born, in the small moments in our lives where we are forced to take pause and take notes of this story that's brewing inside of us, so much so we are compelled to the page. Denise Levitov talks about this as apperception, being brought to the page after a constellation of experiences spills over and out. And so we have no choice but to sit down and tell a story. So the conversation tonight is rooted in these values, in this lifeway model. So I'm very honored to introduce our panelists tonight. Joining us, we have Dr. Amanda Tkachin. Dr. Tkachin is Navajo from Ganado, Arizona. She is Nanasteja Tkachini, born for Tlizaflane. So in a way, she's actually my mother. Um, she is an assistant professor in educational leadership and innovation at Arizona State University, whose research is focused on indigenous knowledge systems and the interplay of socio-political conditions impacting the lives of Native peoples. Our two panelists tonight that are joining us, um, 
and I'm very honored to introduce them. Uh, Lucy Tapahanso is Professor Emerita from English, of English Literature from the University of New Mexico and served as the inaugural Poet Laureate of the Navajo Nation. She is the recipient of a 2018 Native Arts and Culture Foundation Artist Fellowship. And uh, Lucy is actually my grandmother through Clan as well. And then we have Laura Tohi. Laura Tohi is the Neh and the current Navajo Nation Poet Laureate. She published three books of poetry, an anthology of Native women's writing, and an oral history on the Navajo Code Talkers. Her librettos, Enemy Slayer, a Navajo Oratorio, and Nahastan in the Glittering World premiered in Arizona and France. So, so thank you all so much for, for joining us this evening. I'm so excited to, uh, to bear witness to this conversation. And I'm gonna go ahead and pass it on over to uh, Dr. Touching. Uh, yeah, Jake, I caught your pass over here. Good evening or good morning. Yat e she ya manda tachi ni anishya nanda eje tachi ni nishlo is a sana bashish chin tramanta she che ya don shi ya tashanale look ant ke nasha kut ego e zana nishne. I am so excited to be here with all of you today to talk with incredible Dene women who have shaped me and influenced me in so many ways. I've had the privilege to be in their thinking all day for many days and then especially today where I took the time to read both of their work, to listen to them on video and to just be in their presence. And I just wanna tell both of you, you've, you hugged me when I needed to be hugged. You made me laugh when I needed a good laugh and I needed to remember um, all the goodness and the humor that we have as Dene people. And you made me remember about the love that we have with our family and our community. And that's just such a blessing. And it's just a blessing to be in, in community with you all today. So I can for your time. If you don't mind turning on your cameras so uh, we can begin in a little bit on Shona, Laura and Lucy. I also wanna thank Jake and Jake is amazing because Jake was the mastermind behind bringing us together. And he was always so thoughtful of saying, I want the woman to come together. And just in a really respectful and generative way has provided us the space. So thank you, Jake, for just bringing us together. And hopefully this evening, this Saturday night, we can have some good story sharing. We can feel good and maybe feel a little hug tonight and maybe we'll extend that hug to our loved ones that may be near or far. So, thank, um, so I'm just joyful as you can tell for this wonderful journey we're having tonight. So I um, thought in our discussion um, today, we are gonna talk about the gorgeous book that Lewis Erdrich has offered us and before we get there, I thought we can start with a little bit lighthearted questions on Shona. What do you think, ladies? To maybe get us a little bit um, for me, so I won't be so shy. <laughs> <laughs> to get us giggling a little bit, that sometimes helps. <laughs> yeah. So I thought, you know, I know we've been through a lot this year, all of us. And I thought maybe let's start with and even despite all of that we're feeling this year, what has brought you joy recently? What has made you smile or maybe your heart tickle a little bit more? Ashana, what has brought you joy? Laura, do you wanna start first and then Lucy? Okay. Um, I guess there's a lot of things Again, small that have brought me joy. Um, and I guess I equate also um, joy with thankfulness because, you know, the pandemic and things that have happened since it began. So the joy that I, I feel is to be thankful that my family is safe and um, we continue to go on, you know, doing our work. And I'm also joyful because I um, helped develop a program for 
uh, Navajo kids on the res to uh, a poetry writing workshop. And I held a, a Jake, actually Jake Skeets and I sponsored this, um, this program. So and then it was probably, we had four winners and I published it in the Navajo Times. So the kids were very happy about that too. So those are kind of things that I, I'm joyful about and that I got my second vaccination. So <laughs> that is also helpful. And also I am, before I go any farther, I neglected to also introduce myself to everyone. She'e Laura Tohi in the Arizona State University, the Banash Nation, the English Department, going there. Beso Selva Cook at Masha Shalan, Shinajnish, a cut or a son, so probably some of you out there are maybe my relative, and I also want to say uh, greetings to all of you and thank you, thank, thank you for coming in into this chat room. And also I want to thank uh, Jake Skeets for uh, putting this together. He's did a lot of work in doing this months back. He invited me and, and I also want to thank the Piper Center and Jake Friedman and all all the people behind the scenes who helped make this event possible and to you, Amanda, uh, this is the first time we've met. So thank you for that. So those are the things I just want to have some joy for, yeah. It's beautiful. Lucy Nasha. Turn your, oh, yeah. I'm myself. <laughs> Uh, thank you as well to everyone who put this together. I really like the idea of um, spending Saturday night with all kinds of people from all over and, you know, talking about what um, really brings um, all of us joy, which is the uh, essence of storytelling and humor and memories and family history and community. Um, so I'm very, you know, I'm just really grateful to be a part of this. Uh, um, so I too am really glad to have um, my vaccination. So I was, uh, telling uh, my husband that now I can bust out of here <laughs> with a <the> mask. <laughs> and I'm hoping that I can go back up to Shiprock and see my family, my siblings and relatives. I haven't been back up there in so long. It just, my heart just aches to go back and see them. And all my siblings have been vaccinated. So we're just gonna be hugging each other a lot. <laughs> Um, oh, good. I, um, I'm really grateful just to have this, have had this time uh, to be in my home, mm. to create the sunsets and sunrises, um, to uh, bake all kinds of desserts for my husband who has a sweet tooth like nobody <laughs> I've ever seen. <laughs> and, uh, to, you know, just always cuddle with my little chili, Lupita. <laughs> so that, I'm very joyful for that and that my children are all safe and our grandchildren. Um, and at, at least uh, my dog, Misty, lives in um, Misty Rainy with an Albuquerque. And we're in each other's pod so we can see each other. So I'm for that because there's nothing like being around kids you know they're just my grandchildren mm -hmm. so um funny and innovative and serious and um it just just makes me happy to be in their presence so um i'm really grateful for that oh 
yes, I agree with both of you. I think when I got my second vaccine, also I'm grateful for that. And my children make me laugh. Speaking of my youngest, Noelle, she was sure thought the needles was that long. She wanted me to take a picture of the needle when I was getting my vaccine. <laughs> and I said, it's not that big. It's just a little one. She said, take a picture then. It felt real <laughs> weird trying to take a picture at the clinic. <laughs> People are probably thinking, why is she taking a picture of her, her shot? <laughs> but they just make you so much joy. And I'm glad that you both are talking about our children. I feel like this work of storytelling is multi-generational. We tell our stories for them. And we are alive and because of the stories that we were told of survival amongst our people. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm really excited that you all are, are sharing in those words. So in, in thinking about, and you said a little bit, Lucy, about something that has surprised you, or maybe it was surprising me, and I'm putting it on you, which, is, which isn't fair. You talked about cooking, and you talked about how you've been baking a little bit more for um, your husband. So I was going to ask you both, what what are you doing during this time that you're that you're surprised about because we're staying home and we there's a different dynamics that we're in our lives now and what are you learning about yourself during this time that maybe is surprising you and i'll give an example for me what has been really beautiful is we started a garden and um, here in the Phoenix, uh, in the land of the Akuma Atam and Peeposh, we're learning how to cultivate the desert lands with my babies and my husband and our friends. And it has just brought me so much joy to be and touch the soil and to eat the good food, you know, to be able to offer that to family and friends when we're in good harvest. So it has really surprised me that I'm actually getting down in the dirt. <laughs> it's been a long time since I've been doing that and it just feels really good. So um, what has surprised you during this time? For me, um, uh, I started weaving again mm. and I'm, I, I just get so, um, I really feel like when I start, I want to make sure I have a few hours because I don't want to just do it for 30 minutes and do something else. Mm -hmm. I come into a state and it's like um, just remembering all kinds of things and then having memories of different things, conversations with people and um, songs and stories it seems like the the act of weaving uh, because it's so instilled you know in in our culture that you have to you can't help but think of it as like you have the whole universe in front of you mm. and the present and the future um so for me that's been really wonderful it, um and then having just been able to write um, all the time. Um, the other thing, which is kind of funny, is that one of my friends, Betty, who's a few years older than me, told me a few years ago, maybe two or three years ago, she said, have you gotten to the point um, in your age where um, in the afternoon you just have to like take a little nap? <laughs> and I oh, I haven't gotten there yet. But now I have. <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> sometimes afternoon, I, I'll be doing all kinds of stuff because I'm just I like always just doing all kinds of things. My plants and then doing stuff outside and the house and cooking and, you know, just the routine things. Mm -hmm. But like around one or two, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so sleepy. And it's just so nice to have that freedom to say, well, I'm just going to go take a nap. Come on, Peter. <laughs> Let's go mm -hmm. cuddle. <laughs> so mm -hmm. just you know, take a nap like for 20 or 30 minutes. Then I get up refreshed and I'm all ready to go again. So mm -hmm. I have up until that point, Betty. <laughs> it's really <laughs> nice. <laughs> what if I was still working? I felt like, yes, that would be kind of hard. <laughs> so, 
so I'm grateful for my energy. <laughs> Good. Well, for me, um, uh, I have been working a lot during this retirement, and I was very fortunate to get a, a um, Academy of American Poetry Fellowship. And so I developed uh, some community programs um, for teachers and for students on, the, on my homeland, the Navajo Nation. And so that was very gratifying. Um, but once that was over and I started, you know, thinking about what I wanted to write about, my solitude at home made me realize that in a way I was always prepared for this uh, quarantine because I grew up in this little community called Crystal, New Mexico, mm -hmm. which is on the res. Mm -hmm. And when I was there, we didn't have television, we didn't have newspapers, you know, we lived in a very kind of an isolated uh, community. And I had my brothers, you know, we played. And there were a lot of things we could do, you know, by, we could go to the lakes and fish or play in the water. There was just a lot of th things to do. Uh, right there in, in Crystal, in that little community. And I started to realize that, you know, I, when I was growing up, I was already, you know, practicing being quarantined. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that is, um, I, I learned that about myself. And also I learned that I started thinking more about growing up. Uh, I had time to think about things that I, grew the people that I grew up with and I thought specifically about my paternal grandmother who was a weaver and I started thinking about some of the things that she taught me and being around her and so I've been writing about that hmm. and I also have a loom set up but I haven't gotten to that yet <laughs> hopefully I will do do that and then I also started thinking about that little community of crystal so I wrote a little essay about that and um, so I've just been doing a lot of things. People have been asking me to do talks or readings and that's been keeping me very busy. And one of my friends said, I have flunked retirement. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I guess that's, you know, you, you're supposed to I take naps and, you know, take it easy, but I'm just over there working hard at the computer <laughs> and, you know, just staying really busy. But, I enjoy it, you know, this is what I wanted to do is to continue to contribute to my community in whatever way I can. So yeah, so that, that's been joyful for me. Mm, that's great. Well, thank you for sharing a little bit about what you've done over the last few months with uh, the both of you. It's, um, I think a lot of us are finding new surprises of ourselves, maybe returning to rest and uh, maybe returning to the loom in this time. And so I think if you all want to share a little bit of, in, your, in the chat about what are the things that has surprised you during this time, um, uh, that would be lovely. I think it's a good reminder for us because it is a hard time. And it's a reminder for us to see the goodness that is thriving, that we're trying to cultivate during, during moments of, that we're, we're in these quarantine or social distancing from others. I'm going to transition and so we can start speaking about the lovely um, book that was gifted to us and I have it here, The Roundhouse by Lewis Erdrich. Um, and we're, we may do some spoilers if you haven't read it, uh, we may not. Uh, we're going to, we have some questions that are threaded through. We've been really thoughtful and I really give a lot of credit to Jacob thinking about these questions along the line of our Deneth thought and ways of of knowledge that he shared about thinking and planning and action and reflection. So those are gonna be questions are threaded through in that way that also brings to light Laura and Lucy's thinking as the Neh writers, as the Neh woman. Um, and so before we do that, let me just share a little bit about The Roundhouse. You know, The Roundhouse is a novel that was first published in 2012. 
and it tells of a story from the life of a 13 year old boy named Joe Coates, who with his three friends, who we all loved, if you read it, like hearing their friends, growing up with the res friends, you kind of get their character, you see those people in your head, I did. The three friends set out to find the abuser and the rapist that attacked Joe's mother. So the book brings to light uh, some really tough issues that are facing our people, indigenous peoples in this settler nation state. It brings to um, issues of jurisdiction of tribal law and US federal and state law. It brings up the sexual violence against indigenous women, which is linked to the ongoing violence and the, and the movement of the missing and murdering indigenous women, girls and two spirit. It sheds light on justice and the complexities of policies and settler colonialism impacting indigenous peoples today. Lewis Erdrich is a gift for us and the work has been a gift for, for many of us. And I feel like it's gonna be for generations. And so tonight, the book has laid the groundwork of many layers as um, Laura wrote earlier, we were communicating by email about this. And she said, you know, it lays the groundwork and puts so many layers tonight for our discussion. So you'll see that threaded through, um, throughout. We will, if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat and I'll try my best to monitor them, but we'll save some time um, and keep, I'll keep note of those questions towards the ending part of our discussion here tonight. So please feel free to add those um, there. So in keeping with that um, Jake shared, let's begin with our first question, which is around Saskia's, which is thinking. So what did you, can you tell us um, ladies about your thoughts about the roundhouse and some of its themes that I just shared? And, and also we're talking about storytelling and sovereignty and eh. I'll show it and maybe, um, Laura, do you want to go first and then Lucy, is that okay? Okay, I'm fine. Okay. Okay, okay. so um, Lucy and I had a discussion about some of the things in this novel and um, we were started out talking about um, our identity as Diné women and which is part of one of the themes in the book. And the other theme is the sense of community that is pervasive throughout the novel. And I think that um, that is also important to understand because all of us introduced ourselves at the beginning by our clan. And that tells us, you know, that this is who we are, this is the family that we come from, this is who, what families we belong to. And it kind of centers us and it tells us, you know, a, a little bit about who we are. Um, and it also, um, I just want to tell you, my, my, one of my grandfathers said that when you express your clan to uh, an audience or whoever, you know, you're speaking to, he said, it's like giving a touch of love you know, and I just love that expression, this little touch of love. <laughs> so I think that's part of this novel is that there is a very strong sense of community. The people um, look out for each other, the women, especially um, uh, Lucy and I were talking about how the women are very much the center of the family and the community. And um, the women are also, you know, the ones that make a lot of the decisions that need to happen. Um, so I think that our sense of community is foundational as Native people. So, and uh, it's very true in this novel as well. Thank you, Laura. Um, that's very much the case. And um, I think in this novel, we saw um really wonderful um examples of tech, that sense of um community um individually and then also as a community um respect having respect for each other and being generous 
Uh, we saw that and how this, this, these three boys, four, three, four boys, you know, go to different houses. They, when they're hungry, they, they think about what time of day it is, what people are going to be doing, and who's, you know, who, who will feed them. And sure enough, they just go to different houses and then, and then these women feed them. And, um, and so there's just that, you know, you really have a sense of the community as, uh, where you can walk anywhere. You don't have to take a bus or drive. These guys are just on their bikes and going all over. So uh, the distance or, or the proximity of the community and then how that allows for um, community relationships, how people have connections with each other, relatives. And then, uh, and even in this community, um, these with the, with the four boys um, who are kind of the central characters. Um, as time goes on, they're surprised to learn that they are related to each other. And it's through talking with their grandparents. So that sense of helping each other and having empathy. And then also, you know, um, perhaps from the outside, it might not seem like these, uh, these young men um, have uh, um, are aware or um, embody traditional values, but I felt like Joe, who's thirteen, and his and his friends really had a sense of self determination or sovereignty. You know, Navajo we say, It's whatever happens. It's up to you how you respond to it. And for a 13 year old who's very astute, he had really was very close to his parents and his father's a tribal judge. And he had like a basic understanding of Indian law. Um, so he would sneak um, and borrow, you know, sneak and look at Felix Cohen's <laughs> um, uh, classic uh, work of um, law. And then he took it upon himself to, to begin. He wasn't satisfied with the way the investigations were going. So he really took it upon himself to find out what had happened, to look into it. And um, he was determined to do that. So, I, so he had this sense himself of his own sovereignty, like I can do this, I know, I, I can handle this. Um, but then, yeah, so we see then the contrast between the way that he felt, and we have to keep in mind that even though his father was the tribal judge, um, in this case, because it was his wife, you know, he he, he was kind of, he, he, it was too traumatic for him to kind of figure out what to do himself. So, um, so then we see this sense of sovereignty in this young man, young boy, um, clash just uh, in, in a really heartbreaking way with uh, the tribal, um, federal, state um, laws. And so the place where the institute, the incident took place um, couldn't be, they couldn't move on it because they couldn't determine, the, the mother couldn't remember for a long time where it actually happened. So there was all these questions of jurisdiction. So it just kind of stopped there. Um, and it took a while for, you know, things to begin to happen. But meanwhile, this Joe, and his friends were just out investigating, doing, you know, what they felt they needed to do. They really uh, just sort of stepped up because he, he felt like uh, he was the one that had to do it. So uh, I really appreciated how the legal, the larger legal issues um, were reflected and then how uh, this, you know, these young boys had, just that sense of themselves. And they had a knowledge that perhaps at that point they didn't really, it seemed like he didn't know how much he knew, but mm -hmm. how, how he, that he knew the basics, but he did. And so that really came, you know, came to the forefront when he needed it. 
Can I add to what Lucy said yeah, about, please. Uh, about community? Um, when this rape happens and when all these other crimes happen in the community, it really um, affects the whole community. Mm -hmm. So you have, you know, a community that's living and things are going well until these crimes happen. And then it just seems to almost like shatter the whole community. And they're, they're, they have to figure out how to put things back together. Some balance has to be restored. And I think in the character of Joe, he takes on that responsibility uh, for his community and for his mother, because uh, his mother is very much a part, you know, a center of his life. And so I think that in this, this story of Joe, he's just 13 years old and in this process of what he realizes he has to do to um, seek out justice for his mother and for his community, in a sense, he has to sacrifice himself, I think. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and he's only 13. And, and as I was reading this, you know, I was thinking how much that must have had to be a burden on such a young boy, you know, to um, have to do what he did for his mother because um, there was the failure or the limitations of Western uh, the forms of justice were not there. They were not there in place uh, on this community. And so I think the novel really brings out these, the juxtaposition of what is justice mm -hmm. and how it's defined by Western society and how it's defined by tribal people. And those two, you know, often they don't really, uh, there's conflict there. And, you know, we, and so this, I think Erdrick really brings this out in, well, how these two laws don't always work for, um, well, at least the Western doesn't always work for Native people. And Native people's laws are not often recognized by the Western uh, government. And so I think this is a really big part of the novel is, you know, what is justice and who, who is responsible and who fails and then who takes on this responsibility uh, for justice. And it turns out, you know, it's a young boy that steps up uh, mm -hmm. for not only his, his mother, but I think for his community. And he pays a price um, for that, I think. Mm -hmm. That's very true. Um, the other thing that I appreciated about the novel is that um, it was a really good reflection of the way that um, in our communities um, and just with each other, you know, there's like a really uh, wonderful sense of humor. There's, mm -hmm. you know, is there for everything. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, at one point, somebody that uh, um, with one of the cousins that's a powwow dancer that someone that's non-Indian comes a young woman and um, stays like for a week or something and she's a hippie <laughs> and wears Birkenstock so they begin to call oh, him yeah. <laughs> Birkenstock <laughs> and um, the, just well, the way that they, um, just the way they relate to each other and how they gain their names and um, the way that they, yeah, it's just so funny that it's like they're, they're, they're so humorous and comical, but they don't know it themselves <laughs> because that's just kind of the way their everyday life is and the way that they, um, you know, just how memorable and how how they use the English language like just to really pinpoint something that somebody else could easily miss but they just have such a wonderful love of language and mm -hmm. and then uh yeah so that's that's one thing that I really uh, you know that I really appreciated mm -hmm. the idea that um 
in order for someone to be uh, to be an Indian, you have to be on the tribal roles. You have to have so much blood, and it has to go back, you know, generations, and it has to be on paper. And this is according to the federal government. You know, mm-hmm. you have to have documentation. But then in the community, people know who's Indian just by looking at them. You know, you just like have this this innate recognition of identity. And then the way that um, personalities or uh, people change, their core identities change, as traumatic as this happens, we see how the mother, you know, just becomes like, the shadow of herself. She's she she is really uh, you know just changes so much as well as the aunt is her sister. Mm-hmm. She started smoking and smoking, and they've never seen her do that. And the father as well. He you know they just are so affected by what happened that it's like they become different people. Um. So I. There's, there's just such wonderful, uh, so many wonderful aspects uh, that just in, in telling the story because it's a novel and it's a story, um, you just uh, recognize so much of what it is to be indigenous and how, what that, you know, what that means, the resourcefulness that people have, how they are able, there's a section um, in which um, one of the homes are described and they say that there's so much stuff or so much junk around their house, but somehow they make use of each of them when the time Mm -hmm. comes. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. Um, We're good at that. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) that sense of resilience and the kind of survival you know you just don't know when you'll need something um but mm-hmm. as well you know the sense of ritual that they have the sweat lodges and the way that when the mothers, uh, you know, still really traumatized and Joe and his father are eating and he and Joe thinks that there has to be some kind of a ceremony before they eat, that they have to do something. Mm-hmm. So that ritual is really instilled and they knew that the roundhouse was sacred as well as, you know, when they have a powwow, everything that goes into that, um, how important that is. So so there was just like things that were uh, really traumatic and then things that uh, kind of balance that, you know, just like, so you, you feel hopeful anyway, I think. Yeah, I feel like Louise Erdrich, that's her gift. She's able to talk about all of these issues like you just talked about blood quantum jurisdiction, you know, um, coming of age story, all of these things in a, in a book. And I think as me as a scholar, sometimes when I want to start talking about blood quantum pages, pages, pages later, whereas Erdwich is doing it in a succinct, she did it in like in a paragraph and she was able to explain it and then go with her narrative. And I've heard that there's law professors who teach federal Indian law that actually use this book in, com- in companion with Co- Cohen's book, you know, the federal Indian law book, because many of the court cases that you read, and I know we've all read those court cases there, you get a little bit of story, but you're just, they're very technical and legalese language. And, but to have this then, I, to have a companion where you're bringing the humanity you're bringing the idea of community and sovereignty and friendships. You're understanding this through the eyes of a teenager. Then it puts these legal documents that you're reading into, into life, okay. that this is happening. And she's able to offer that. And um, I feel like it's been, for me, it's been wonderful to see how she's able to pack so much strong issues in a narrative story form. 
Um, and you all touched on so many ways in which I was just astounded. I was really mesmerized by the friendship between the boys and the respect that they carried with each other and this rhythm and pattern of understanding my friend is hurt, my mom's friend is hurt, so I'm gonna respect and not go over there. And, you know, understand that we don't, we usually go over there and eat all the time, but now we're not because something's going wrong. Or I'm gonna switch shoes. Remember where they switch shoes? Him and Katie, I'm gonna switch <laughs> shoes because he wants to wear my shoes right now. Like just this love and respect. And I feel that's so beautiful regarding young boys to see friendships in that way, um, to see how they can show love for each other and care for each other um, in that time. So I felt like that was a storyline that I was really mesmerized by. As I have a teenager son, I think about him along those lines too. Mm -hmm. And so, and so, um, and following in this idea, we talked about in Kiss, reflecting, we reflected on the book and moving into planning now, or as Jake says, actualization. And how do you align your thinking, your, your, your ways of knowing and the notion of eh, as a Dene woman when you're writing and when you're thinking about and I, I remember I was thinking of this question because I feel like Luis was speaking to us as natives. She didn't have to explain it, we got it. You know, she was speaking through that indigenous gaze, not through a white gaze. And she was, so we got the jokes. We didn't have, she didn't have to explain it. We laughed and chuckled and moved on. So how have you all been able to do your writing and assert yourself as a Dene woman and writer, knowing the audience is general and we got folks from all over reading your book and they're not all Dene. So how, what are your thoughts about that? Um, you know, uh, a lot of my writing is based in stories that were told to me or stories that are, that I, you know, when I'm talking with people on the phone, you know, I don't know, we we'll, we'll just like always um, just fall into the storytelling mode. And there's a certain kind of, um, uh, for me, it's like a certain stance that you take that's different from if you're writing an essay hmm. or some kind of scholarly work. It's different from that. Um, what I like, you know, one of the things I like about the Roundhouse is that it's told in a way that is both contemporary and yet traditional. That's why we recognize ourselves. And then we see that with Joe, he's been taught so much that uh, as, as he as he's growing up, he's very aware of his history and, you know, the fact that uh, why he's an only child, his parents' history. Um, this is just like things he's gathered as, his, as he's growing up um, and they become really useful to him. So the story is not by itself. It extends back. It includes other people. It includes the land. It includes animals. And I really like that he had a dog named Pearl. Mm-hmm. I was, gosh, such an elegant name for a dog. <laughs> <laughs> and you write about your dog, Lucy. I know it. I'm and I love it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, so when, when I'm writing, that's kind of like, I, I, I can easily, you know, because I'm just like always talking with people and family and my sisters and relatives and children which just seems like every time we talk we always end up laughing then <laughs> um so that's really kind of a part of it and to so to rough when i'm writing it's like an homage and appreciation of how those stories operate in our lives and how they continue to and then you learn from them as as you said uh, mandy that you know you learn um because you're already part of it. Nothing mm -hmm. has to be explained. You're, you're aware of it. You're mm -hmm. like right in the middle of <laughs> right in the middle of the whole thing. So for me, um, that's 
kind of how I think about um, storytelling is that it's why we why we're here. You know, one of the things that I was told when I went to college when I first when I left Shiprock was that um, they had a prayer for me when I left, and I was told then that one of the things, or what we know that um, they said, remember that you're made out of prayers, songs, and stories. Mm. That's who you are. And that's what's going to get you through anything that happens to you. And it was really true. Mm. So, uh, so I think the book did that in a much more contemporary, you know, and contemporary way. Mm. I think for, like for me, when I was growing up, um, my late mother used to tell me that when I was, I don't know, maybe after I learned how to talk, she said, I made up this family and it was five people were in this family. And she said, I had a story for all those characters in that, my fantasy. And I don't know why I, she said, you, you named your characters Tom Fool, Mama Fool, <laughs> Father Fool, <laughs> and then some other names. <laughs> and um, she said that I would just talk about these characters. And I don't remember doing that. But she said one of her friends would come over to visit my mom and she would ask me, she said, tell me your story about your Tom Fool story. And I guess I would just <laughs> make things up there. Aww. So maybe that was the premonition that I was going to be a writer, which I always wanted to be when I was growing up. Um, so I did, you know, eventually I became a poet first, I think, and then I started writing stories. But I think the stories that, um, that I know come from my family that really were the instrumental in me becoming a writer by listening to their stories, listening to my mother's stories. And this was something that I didn't even realize I had this storytelling tradition because I went to um, a school that, where I read only stories and books written by non-native uh, people. So I didn't know, I didn't know that, you know, we could, we had stories because all the stories I heard were all being told to me in the car as we drove to get groceries or, you know, when we would go visit someone, they'd always be telling stories. And I guess I never equated that with storytelling. I thought the story was you read it in the book. But um, so I, when I was growing up, I started writing stories, first of all, from stories that my mother told me. The first one was a story about, um, prairie dog um, that it was a children's story my mom told me about how this these two children were abandoned by their parents and they eventually became uh, a prairie dog and mm. some of you probably know that story mm -hmm. Lucy I think knows <laughs> and so I, I started writing like from that point of view and then later on as I um, started writing more I kind of left that, that place, I guess. And I remember I, Lucy and I were living in Albuquerque many years ago in the seventies. And she had already, you were just publishing your first book, Lucy. And um, I remember we, we were friends then and uh, you would tell me what you were writing about, you know, and, and um, anyway, we were we knew about each other's work and so you know she, lucy actually inspired me to wow. uh, you know to write more but um i think for me storytelling is part of that belief and what my mother said is that without stories you're you don't have much to, inside you and she was saying that if you you have to know stories because it guides you through life it's something mm -hmm. you can pass on and in this, in this novel, uh, I mean, yeah, in this novel, um, I think Erdrick is doing two things. She's writing about the, the, the contemporary world um, of this family going through um, 
this distress. And then there's another story that's happening when Musham, you know, starts telling stories at night in his sleep. And mm -hmm. that story is, you know, of the sto stories of time immemorial or stories of long ago. And those stories he brings up is the Windigo, uh, which is a flesh eating monster. And so he brings up that story and what happens to this mother and her son and the community. Because um, it's said that the Windigo is a flesh eating cannibal and it's never satisfied even though it continues to eat and devour humans. And so it's, it's a monster in the story. And so there's that story that's occurring alongside the contemporary story. And there's a lot, I think, another lot of things going on with that Wendigo stories. Mm -hmm. um, but the reason why I brought that up is as a writer, I often go to those places of time immemorial mm -hmm. and write those stories. And to me, it's really a way to escape what's in the contemporary world. I feel like there's so much mystery there. And I want to enter that mysterious world and write stories about that. And it's, it's such a, um, it's such a comfort when, you know, for me, when I write something and it's turned into something else, like I've been writing librettos, which are the um, words for an opera. So I'm, some of my, work has been going in that direction of and then when I write it and I read it back and I thought where did I go <laughs> where did I go wow. and you know did I'm writing these things about things that happen in some primordial time hmm. and um so I you know I can see how I can appreciate what Erdrich is doing because I see it in my own writing and how I can enter that space that I don't even know where it is, mm -hmm. but it's there for me. And so the Erdrich then is, you know, also working with that whole idea of these stories that happen in some other place, some other time, but it's also set in the contemporary and she's working with those two things. Mm -hmm. And in her stories, you know, the Wendigo is very much a I guess it's a symbol of what's happening in, in um, Joe's world of the um, man that um, murders or rapes and then murders um, the woman. And so in this novel, there's also other instances, not only of women, of the native women being violated, but also um, the woman who lives with Whitey for some reason, her name just escapes my mind. Um, uh, Sonia. Oh, Sonia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Sonia. Mm -hmm. yeah. She's also violated by Whitey and gets beat up. And she mm -hmm. also bears those scars of having been violated from, a, from another relationship. And mm -hmm. so there's all of that, those elements of what is going on today in this world. And that's what Erdrich, I think, is the power of this novel is, is that she's bringing this out and this is what's happening in our native communities with the missing and murdered women. And um, I was doing some research on this and there have been some bills that have been passed mm -hmm. um, more recently um, for, to address this. And one of those was uh, uh, called Savannah's Act. Mm -hmm. which was introduced by uh, Lisa Murkowski in uh, 2019. And this bill was to address um, the Department of Justice to review and revise and develop law enforcement and justice uh, protocols to address the missing and murdered Native Americans. And that was also from, she also addressed the Savannah, uh, Savannah's Law which is really specifically addresses um, how native women have gone missing or have been murdered. Um, and because the laws as they are set up does, don't really, are not adequate 
to even uh, keep track of what the numbers are, the statistics are. So there's a lot of statistics that are missing. And one thing that I appreciate what Erdrich did is at the, at the uh, end of the book, she talks about the statistics of how many Native women have been uh, murdered by non-Indigenous men. And oftentimes the parents don't even know what happened to them. So that's uh, caused a crisis in Native communities. And then more recently, uh, Deb Hallen, who is uh, Laguna, and she's a member of the House of Representatives, also introduced a law, a bill, um, the uh, bill to, I have it right here. The Not Invisible Act, which uh, was to help create an advisory committee of tribal leaders, law enforcement, and survivors towards reducing violent uh, crime on Native lands and against Native Americans. So I think that some of these um, bills in, in the government, we can start addressing um, what has happened to Native women. And I think that's what I think Erdrich was doing is in this novel because she was saying how she had this idea to write about um, missing and murdered women. She said everyone would just yawn, you know, thinking it wasn't going to be something interesting to read. But she did do a lot of research and um, started writing about this issue. And so I think with this novel, even though it's over, it's about 10 years old, it really brings out what is happening into our communities, um, not only in this country, but also in Canada. Mm -hmm. That's very true. Um, there, I think last year there was um, a call to renew the um, Violence Against Women Act, which had initially been passed it seems like in 2015 or something, and it was up for renewal. So um, I'm not quite sure what the status of that is, but it was specifically to address um, the um, this issue of women um, going missing or found murdered. So, and it seems that um, it's it's been ongoing all this time, but now in this time of national reckoning, um, it's much more of a focus on it, which is really good. But mm -hmm. I think we're all, over time, this has been, it's been constant. It just that we didn't, there wasn't the media coverage where there were people in, mm -hmm. in the power that were aware of it or addressed it. Mm -hmm. so, so I think that um, the novel is really powerful in that way because at the end, she she does list resources and ways to um, you know ways to be to uh, uh, for people to become involved in this. And so, in the novel is um, in its own way a call to action. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing. Um, the political implications that I feel literature offers so much, and um, as we read from this, and all of the all of the the ways in which the our our young girls and women and relatives have been harmed, and and how she was able to bridge that today, or in our in this reading, I um, I want to turn to some questions and answers. I'm being thoughtful of time, and it and I'm the reason why I'm pausing a little is because I feel it. I feel that weight of the challenges that our people are facing, and the and the work that she's doing to really provide light to the issues. And that's that's a that's a that's something that I think as Native women we do a lot, and we think about it in our writing. How can we still do that? And both of you have done that, and you're in your distinct and beautiful ways of bridging and talking about colonization, the injustice impacting our people. And it's it's a lot to do and we carry as a responsibility. So it goes into one of the questions we have here from our audience about, um, and talking about the Navajo women or stories about women that have developed 
your sense of strength in the face of violence, and this could be in all manifestations of Native women. Can you talk about that, of, of your experience in writing and, and thinking about Navajo women and talking about stories that's impacting our, our people? Um, Amanda, can you repeat that? Your voice went out just a little bit, so. Oh, I'm sorry. The question is, I wonder if you can talk about the Navajo women or stories about women that have developed your sense of strength in the face of violence against Native women. Oh. I think in, in my family, um, and I'm not sure if this really answers your question, but when I was growing up, I always was surrounded by Navajo women. Mm -hmm. um, the, these are women that were very much independent women and they were courageous women. And I'm so um, fortunate to have been raised by such women you know, from my mother, um, my aunt, and my grandmothers, you know, these, those were my role models, you know, um, and, and their roles that they took on were very fluid, because they didn't just do domestic chores, they did everything, mm -hmm. you know, they wove, they raised the children, they did domestic things, but they also, you know, raised cattle, and took care of, you know, the livestock, and they worked full time. And they, uh, in my own family, I always use the example of how my mother, uh, because my parents were divorced when I was young, and she raised six of us alone, on a mm -hmm. cook salary at the boarding school. And I remember lots of times how she just showed you, you just have to be a strong woman. And I remember she used to drive us home in the, these blizzards in the winter and the snow was coming down at her, you know, in the, in the windshield. And it was just, I mean, I just always felt like she could get us through and she always did. Hmm. And she also always carried a shovel <laughs> with her. And my grandmother, you know, she was one of the first Navajo teachers, even without a college degree, she wanted to be a teacher and it was needed during the war. So she did that. And my you know, it's just all these women that were always showing me, this is what a woman does. Mm -hmm. This is what you do. This is how you, you know, you, you take care of yourself. So I think those are the women that I look to. And I, so, you know, I feel like that's who I am a part of. They gave me a part of themselves. Um. That's really true that the women are really resourceful. You kind of just feel safe you know, mm -hmm. with, your, with your mother or aunties, your relatives. Um, I think one of, in a general sense um, for uh, Navajo people, you know, we really have a strong matriarchal tradition beginning with um, changing a woman, a white shell girl, almost everything that uh, makes up our identity is, um, we can trace it back to the way the holy people uh, raised her because she was the first Navajo person, first Navajo being, the first human. And so when we look back on that, we begin to sort of see how our identity came about and how to, you know, just how to think about ourselves and the, how important our roles are as women. And um, that we, uh, it's just always been such a part of our history and our identity that we see it reflected, you know, in the way that we were raised and the way that we raise our children and the way that our, you know, the grandchildren think about themselves. And, um, you know, I just am really proud that um, I'm, I'm grateful that 
my grandchildren, even though they don't live um, on the Nepitea, they have a strong sense of themselves as Navajo, as the Nep um, individuals. And um, so it really guides them, even though they're not there. So I think that that's really, you know, that overall, that's kind of what our, our security and our guidance. Mm. Majana, that, that's very true. You made me think about my grandmothers. I was around my grandmothers all the time. I was, whatever they told me to do, Mandy, go do this, Mandy, go do that. I would do it and I loved it. And I just remember thinking about how much they made the business run at home, even though the, you know, my Che would be out there talking to people, he would come back, my grandma would say something to him, you know, they were the ones organizing inside the kitchen when we're cooking the food of who needs help or who do we need to go, who they need to, you know, work to support. And all my grandmothers would be the ones as they're making their nanaskata, they'll be talking about that. <laughs> and then telling their husbands, are my grandpas, you know, so in a lot of ways our as they're cooking, they're planning and strategizing and being leaders too and organizing the what to do and then sharing that with, with, our, with my grandpa. And I just learned so much valuable um, teachings from, from them while I was there running around helping them. So you're, it's right, we learn a lot from our, our mothers and our grandmothers and aunties well, we have, um, I have one more final question. And actually, I think this is a good one as we end and it's con aligned with the, um, the, the, the philosophy of the Nehways and thinking about reflection and Sahasan, right? And, and like the North that we started off with. So, you know, we've been talking a lot about the tragedies that's impacting our family and we can feel the tragedies that's impacting even us today with the pandemic and even the social unrest that's occurring right now, the tremendous loss we've been feeling. What can we learn from Sahasin as we look forward and begin, you know, building the future for our babies tomorrow and tomorrow again? What could we learn from that beautiful teaching of Sassan? In terms of the pandemic, is that what you're asking? Yeah, I think it's general. Like, what could we learn from this, knowing that we've gone through so much loss and even in the book talks about loss and we're feeling loss. But what could we look forward, um, look in thinking about that teaching? Mm -hmm. I wrote an essay on this recently and um, hmm. I was thinking that you know that the even though this pandemic has been a terrible thing for the world, you know, and for all of us, family, community, nation, I think it's really telling us something. I think it's telling us that we have to make some changes um, in ourselves, in in you know, in our communities, and and everywhere. Um, you know, because people of color have been hard hit by this pandemic and even, you know, the, our own people, the Navajo Nation, is so sad that we've lost so many uh, people, you know, from this pandemic. And it's, you know, it just makes me want to cry, you know, because, you know, we've lost so many. And I think about the loss of languages that, you know, it's going to happen because the older people are taking the language and the culture and some of the um, the philosophy, the teachings with them, and that's really you know that's really sad because you know there could be a gap there. So I, I think that the pandemic is telling us that we have to make some changes, um, and we know about all the um, all the things that have made the pandemic worse the um the loss of you know of family uh, food deserts um, lack of adequate water lack of, of medical resources close by um just so much you know and um 
health, you know, we've, we have to do something, I think, about uh, our health as Native people, because long ago, uh, actually just within might be my parents' generation, you know, we could um, do things like we grow our own cornfield, we grow our own, own food, mm-hmm. and that was nourishing to us. That was our food sovereignty. Um, we exercised more. We walked or we rode horses, you know, or we herd sheep, you know, or we walked to, you know, along to, we walked to our families, our relatives' houses. If it wasn't too far, you know, and we rode horses, you know, all of that, it's, you know, we've been, we've left behind, you know, and I think that we have to think about how we can make our bodies strong again, how we can keep our languages, you know, how we can nourish our, our culture. And I think it's going to take not only us, but it's going to take everyone um, in our communities are so much that can be done locally and nationally. We need, you know, we all need to work together. So I think it's, you know, I really am hopeful that this pandemic, this virus, this big cough, you know, we'll, we will learn something from it and that we will learn the lessons from it, what it's trying to tell us and that we can become a stronger people. We can become a stronger nation. Mm. Um, along with what Laura said, which is, you know, really insightful, um, so many of us have had to leave our home communities for our education, for our professions, and so, you know, our children and grandchildren are um, not as tied into their home communities as we were and as uh, they could be if we had the same opportunities on our homeland at home. So I think that um, it, it really has shown us how uh, like, that we have to um, make opportunities. We have to find a way to um, have the same professional opportunities that we have off the Netka or the Nebikea um, and there. And I think it's coming to that, you know, with NTU and the Net College, but that really has to be strengthened. Um, and to uh, figure, to, uh, for me, and I think for, um, you know, my, my families, we've had to really adjust to being away from home, but still realize that we're part of that community. Mm. Not being able to go home just has been so hard for all of us, you know, and I just, yeah, that's just heartbreaking to me to, to be away from um, my home that this long. Um, so it's made us, uh, you know, at least it's yeah, made us think about how can we um, maintain our professional lives, the things that we work so hard for to, uh, to succeed in American culture, um, but still um, strengthen the way, you know, our own, our, the, in the ways that we were raised and our own um, ways as, as Navajo people. And I think we, our, our relatives, um, our ancestors and our families have always adjusted to things over time. So I think that this is an opportunity once again to adapt, readjust things and make things so that, um, or we can, uh, you know, we can still have a strong presence in our communities and um, not have to give up uh, what we, you know, as I said, what we work so hard for. Um, so just to find a balance and find a balance in some way. I've thought a lot about that. Why do we have to be away from homes in order to succeed? Um, I would much rather be over there, and and we have the the knowledge as professionals. We have the knowledge and the know how to to be able to do those kinds of things 
if we were there, <laughs> you know, that's sort of the main thing. So that's, I, I for me, it really kind of, uh, uh, you know, sh reflected on, made me think about those kinds of things. Like we, we have to find ways to, to just find a balance between our traditional values, our language, our history, our ties to the land, food, mm -hmm. uh, those kinds of things with, and still, uh, still, <laughs> you know, just still be professionals and, as we want to be in, in the Western American uh, education. Because that's really important too. So just like being pulled <laughs> in different kinds of ways, so. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, thank you both, Laura and Lucy. It's been a joy and honor to be in your presence and know that your words, both tonight, but also in your written words that you have shared with us over the years is a gift for us. And in many ways, when I'm far away from look and hear, when I read your work, it makes me feel like I'm at home home. And today when I was being able to read your work and listen to you, it really hurt, it really helped my heart. And it just was so good. So I just wanna say thank you for tonight, for sharing your time with us today. And thank you so much. Thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Let's give these ladies a round of applause wherever you are. Akiha, <laughs> ladies. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Lucy. Mm -hmm. Skeets, Jake Skeets, Jake Friedman, and everyone for helping this event come forth. Oh, yeah. Thank you. And Maddie, I'm so glad you and Chase are on the forefront of things. Just gives me hope for the future. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Thank yeah. you. Okay, good night. Good night.